I'm Anne Marie Bro. I'm filling in for her. So um, thanks to everyone who's here. And there is an awful lot of good work that's been done in the last three sprints. So we're going to get right to it. Um, is everybody seeing the slides? Hopefully. Yes, thanks. Okay. All right. So normal slides at the front naming the teams and then the individuals on the teams. Not a lot of changes on the teams except um, Anatoly has switched over from, whoops, Anatoly should actually be EPM, um, has switched over from um, Folijet to the core functional team and Bodan is new as of today, I think. So welcome. And I don't think we had any other changes in the slides. All right. And so um, there are a few slides about Q3.1 and 3.2. Um, Jakob, do you want to say anything about the releases? Sure, I'll, I'll just give a quick update. Um, Q3.1 is past us, so the release became public on Monday. Um, according to schedule, uh, the, the reference environment is, uh, as usual, updated to the latest release. It's for the release, AWS index data outcome. Um, and the update it's primarily about uh, the bug fixes because that's what we've been sort of concentrating just before this release is uh, that um, uh, all the bugs that's been uh, triaged for this release, you know, uh, the bugs that got this Q3.1 2019 um, label that's they've been addressed uh, and uh, module uh, bug fix releases have been made on time and incorporated into the release. So, so overall the release is a success. Um, uh, and there is no release notes uh, or statistics specific for this, but they will be available for the final Q3. Uh, can you switch to the next slide, uh, Henry? Yes, I had to check to make sure I had turned the recording on. Okay, cool. Thank you. So the the, the here's the timeline for uh, uh, for the for the end of uh, Q3 release, uh, Daisy. Uh, the module release deadline is September 11th. Uh, uh, so, uh, as usual, the please to you know, please make sure that the release uh, deadline is met, that the modules are released on time, uh, because right after that, uh, the, the platform team will put together a um, a release environment and will uh, tag it so that the bugfest environment can be updated, and the bugfest will run from September 16th to September 20th. Uh, uh, as usual, the bugs will be triaged uh, on the release bug triage uh, channel. Uh, and then the bug fix releases deadline is September 25th. Uh, so uh, hopefully by that date, all bugs are fixed and module uh, get their bug fix releases. Uh, the team again will incorporate that into the release environment and the release branch. And DAISY will become public on September 30th. Uh, so that's the plan for DAISY. Uh, Anne Marie, can you move to the next one? Yeah, and I'll just run through the, the plan for Q4. Uh, so there will not, there, there, there won't be a mid-quarter Q4 release. Um, uh, we're gonna go ahead and follow the quarterly release schedule uh, beyond Q3. Uh, so for Q4, uh, the plan is to have the release deadline on December 4th. Um, uh, uh, so that's the initial release deadline for modules. Then, the, uh, as usual, the bugfest bugfest will take place, and that will uh, take place from December 9th to uh, December 13th. And then, bugfix release deadline is December 18th, and uh, uh, the Q4 release uh, will become public on December 20th. So just uh, just in time for Christmas. Um, yeah, so that's the plan for Q4. And uh, just uh, if there are any questions you know, about the, the timeline, uh, you know, please either ask them here or uh, send, uh, send, uh, send those questions to me or post them on the releases channel. Uh, definition of done updates. 
we have a couple of updates, uh, essentially uh, going forward, uh, requirements that we would like to introduce to the definition of done uh, for, uh, for, for all teams. So we'd like to introduce automatic schema, schema and data migrations in this, uh, 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 in this quarter, so, sort of tar tar targeting the, the, the end of the quarter release. So essentially uh, any new schema changes uh, we'll see in this half quarter uh, should uh, include uh, schema migrations. Uh, now, those will be different depending on the um, on the toolkit or framework used. Uh, some modules use, use different toolkits, but for the RMB based modules, which are the the core uh, modules like circulation and um, inventory, uh, that means using the RMB based uh, migrations, which are um, described in the README. And there is also going to be a step by step guide. Um, uh, ready uh, that walks through a an example of you know how to implement the migration and that's currently uh, on a pull request but it will be available uh, this week um, and then another request is to make sure that we have the APIs especially the new APIs this is the going forward requirements properly documented we've had those uh, documentation guidelines for some time uh, but in some cases they're not being followed. So, uh, so, uh, so they're not undocumented APIs. They are usually problematic for people that want to consume them. So, so clients of those APIs, you know, um, modules, other modules or, uh, or, uh, or the, the reports and so forth. And uh, the, another element here is the, uh, is the, the PR requests with, um, the tech leads from various teams have met over the course of uh, last month, um, trying to uh, finalize a set of guidelines for the pull requests. Um, so uh, various team has been using different uh, sort of approaches here, uh, but we've not had a sort of uh, cross team uh, PI re uh, review guideline in folio. So, uh, so uh, some parts of that, uh, those guidelines have been established. Uh, so we now have a checklist, or actually a collection of checklists for various elements of the of the, the pull request. This is right now targeting the back end, so both the back end implementation and the API changes, but the, the front end one is in progress. And uh, uh, there is a do working document that the tech leads had access to where they could provide feedback. Uh, but there's also uh, now a task to publish uh, the result of that uh, of that work uh, on devfolio.org and this will be done uh, this week as well. And uh, if you're interested in progress, uh, see folio 2020, uh, 2207. Um, and I believe that's it. Could you flip the... Okay, and that's still me. Uh, so I guess we're getting into the highlights. Um, uh, so core platform, uh, there's been many UX prods. Uh, I'll just mention uh, here the ones that uh, uh, that are the highest priority. So RMB 26, uh, 26 have, um, uh, have been released last quarter and that includes a bunch of uh, new functionality and some performance improvements. Uh, Eric will be talking about some, some of those new functionalities uh, for those that are interested in using them. Uh, I'll just mention that those functionalities have been rolled out to mode circulation storage and mode inventory storage. So we were actually benefiting uh, from those new functionalities and the Q3.1 release. And uh, there's been also the, on the DevOps side work to, um, uh, to uh, migrate Folio infrastructure into a, um, a, a, a continu continuously integrated uh, deployment environment based on Kubernetes. And that work is almost complete. Uh, and uh, what this work will enable is the preview capability for PRs. So uh, some functionality we've been, uh, we've been really looking forward to uh, and, and, and the rollout for that functionality will start soon after. Uh, so hopefully uh, next week. Um, and that's the update for the, for the core platform. And I don't know if there's any more slides. Okay, and that I believe that's already Eric. So I, I, I don't know, uh, the, the, so back to you and Marie. I okay. Guess that's the time for demos. Okay. Um, one thing I'll just mention, because um, it always hits me when I look at these timelines. So with the 3.2, we've basically got two, two and a half sprints to finish all the feature work that we said we were going to get done in Q3. Um, so that always strikes a little terror in my heart. Um, but definitely important to pay attention because we've uh, 
got a couple more sprints to plan your work and then we've, we will get on with bug fixes. So as far as the highlights from each of the teams, we're not gonna um, uh, take time for each team to talk about their highlights, but please, when you get the um, uh, PowerPoint uh, after the meeting, please take a look. And if you have questions about any of the highlights, please check in with the product owner or the tech leads for the teams and they can give you more details. And I think we're gonna see the, the best of the highlights in the demos in just a minute. All right, and as to demos, um, we've got lots of people demonstrating today, so let's get right to it. Um, I'm going to stop sharing in a minute, and we're going to start with the Thunderjet folks. So, Dennis, yes, are you on? thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, well said. This is going to be sort of a highlight reel of an incredible amount of work that's gone on over the last three sprints on a lot of different high priority features for acquisitions. Um, and the Thunderjet team has been doing an incredible job of tearing through um, issues in JIRA and, and some of what we won't have time to show today includes some really important updates to invoices and the organizations app, the ability to create invoice lines based on purchase order lines, the ability to define adjustments for invoices, invoice lines, um, relating to cost information, backend work on creating vouchers for paid invoices, and a lot of uh, UX cleanup for organizations like changing our remove buttons to trash cans and, and adding actions like edit and delete into carrot menus, and much, much more. Um, we've also done some work on updating translation support for orders and other things. So uh, just a quick thank you to those of you in the community and other development teams who've noticed issues and have sent them our way. Um, we were doing our best to incorporate uh, some of that work into all of our sprints as well to try and keep up with things. So um, with that, one of the, I believe the first things we're gonna start with here is uh, highlighting some changes that were made to the username and password management in the organization's application, um, which are sort of important things with respect to security. And uh, to, to show some of this, I'm going to hand it over to Alexi uh, and we'll get started. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, so let me uh, share my screen. I hope you can see this. Yes. Uh, so basically, uh, we are heading to organizations application. Uh, here we have uh, organizations management or vendors uh, in the case of purchase orders. And um, basically, it uh, has such thing as interfaces. I believe it's uh, a way vendor contacts, uh, contacts us or delivers uh, online data. Uh, anything so we can uh, it could be added through a separate screen uh, we introduced earlier and uh, it has uh, separate fields for credentials username and password so uh, in uh, this uh, uh, period of time we added uh, like more security to this uh, a new API was introduced where these credentials are stored and uh, basically uh, it's hidden by separate permission so uh, earlier it was displayed to everyone who uh, could uh, could be able to view organization uh, now it's uh, always displays as asterisk um, and uh, we do have a new button show. Uh, it also displays only to users that have uh, permission, like uh, view credentials. So by clicking this button, uh, we go to the separate API, uh, fetch credentials and show it. Uh, 
basically the same form uh, details pane. Here we have our organization and uh, we can go to interface section. So uh, here we have uh, our interface, click show. Here we are username and password. Uh, so basically creates, uh, credentials could be empty. Uh, so no, like no notification uh, required. In that case, they will be empty. And as well as uh, interface can have can have, have only password without username. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, username without password, and uh, vice versa. Um, like only password without username. Uh, so basically, that's it uh, for interfaces. Uh, if you have questions, please address to me. Uh, in this case, I'll pass down the word to Andre. Thanks, Alexi. Thank you. Okay. And Owen's asking actually quickly in uh, chat, it's a permission to view the credentials rather than a permission to see a specific credential. Is that right? Uh, right, it's a common one uh, for every, uh, just a view button and uh, to ability fetch that API. So it's not for specific credential. Thank you, Owen. All right, thanks, Alexi and Andre. Uh, yes, hello. Do you see my screen, I believe? Yes. Okay. Uh, last sprints, uh, Thunder team uh, also worked on linking uh, orders and uh, invoices. And um, now I'm ready to present what we have for now. Let's navigate to uh, orders page, uh, select uh, orders tab. Uh, so, and uh, we can see the list of orders. If uh, we select one of them, we will see the details uh, pane and um, here we added a new accordion uh, named the related invoices um, so here we can see main information about related uh, to order to selected order invoice um, like uh, invoice number invoice date uh, vendor name status and expanded amount uh, it's um, main information about uh, related invoice uh, and uh, the main uh, and very useful feature is that uh, invoice number it's a hyperlink if a user want to know more information detailed uh, you can uh, click uh, on it and uh, he will be redirected to a selected invoice so here we can see more information we were redirected to invoice up and uh, in, uh, if needed, we can uh, see or do something what we need. If we go back, and the same functionality we added uh, was added to PO lines. Here we can see the same accordion is the same information. And um, I want to mention that if there are no related invoices, uh, user will notify it about this on this meme. If you have any questions, let me know. So questions about invoices and orders. It, it's great to see them starting to connect to each other. And if not, then we'll switch over to Makita. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, I hope you see it. Yes. Uh, okay, so today I'd like to present acquisition units, uh, so settings and ability to assign to orders. Uh, for now, we support only orders. And in general, acquisition units, it's a new way to 
uh, to manage restrictions uh, of resources and uh, its sections. So uh, I will show how it works uh, during the demo. So let's create new one. Um, so to create unit, we need to specify the name of this unit and actions that will be restricted. By default, we restrict everything except uh, view. Uh, and let's save for now, uh, just to show the edit action. Uh, and we support edit and uh, remove actions. Uh, remove is uh, available in case uh, there is no assigned users to this uh, unit. And let's edit to, to make uh, it's available uh, during creation. Yeah, it was updated, uh, and let's create one more, uh, one more unit uh, to work with uh, orders application that uh, uh, has some assignments. Yes, save, and uh, on details page we can assign units. And uh, I created this unit before uh, this user before the demo, so let's assign uh, it to previously created unit. And yeah, it was assigned, uh, and we can remove assignments. And you see that uh, delete now is disabled because because uh, there are some connections. Uh, plus, uh, assignments can be created on edit flow. Uh, and actually, that's it with uh, unit management, I mean creation and uh, edit. And let's go to uh, orders module. So for that, I'll use another window and another user. Uh, and to, to create form. Um, and we edit acquisition units field, uh, and currently it displays uh, two units previously created. Um, this one, because uh, create permission wasn't restricted, and uh, this one, because uh, my user is member of this unit. And uh, let's create a new order with, uh, uh, with these units. So yeah, order has been created with uh, such settings. Plus, we support uh, filter by by acquisition units. So yeah, we filter it by it, uh, and uh, user can edit uh, edit order and change uh, previously selected units in case uh, user has permissions. So for this moment, my user has all permissions and it's available. Uh, so I can remove uh, one of the uh, units and just save and it will be updated. Yeah, and uh, let me change user permissions. So uh, this permission uh, is related to uh, enabling acquisition units film, uh, field on create form. So let's remove this. And uh, another permission to manage acquisition units on edit form and uh, remove it as well. And uh, to apply changes, let's uh, sign in again. So yeah, uh, field became disabled because uh, user doesn't have permission uh, to create orders with units. And uh, let's edit previously created with unit. 
and uh, the same is disabled, but uh, user can still see uh, previously selected units. Uh, and uh, mostly that's it with uh, acquisition units. For now, we support uh, assignment and management of these units uh, on orders, uh, ordered items, but uh, we for now don't support uh, restrictions itself and in future uh, users from another units won't be able to edit or delete uh, such orders or invoices uh, actually mostly everything from acquisitions uh, uh, modules uh, and seems that's it for me thank you uh, feel free to ask me so big new functionality in acquisitions that's going to um, spread to other parts, the invoices and the um, finances at some point, but we've started in orders. And was Alexi, did you have one more bit? We do have one more thing, yeah. Okay. There's just one last Real quick. Thing. Little Steve Jobs moment. Yep. Yeah. We have uh, one more uh, thing as templates. Basically, I hope you can see my screen. So, uh, it, I'm not sure if we already have shown this uh, before. Uh, it's a thing uh, uh, that lives in settings uh, for orders and order templates. Basically, uh, we can create a template uh, that contains all information from purchase order and purchase order lines. Uh, it uh, form this form uh, lives in setting. Uh, we can just uh, create something, whatever we want uh, to fill and uh, it lives here. Mm, so we can review this uh, or even uh, edit as well as delete. Uh, so uh, if we know that we will have some kind of uh, similar types of orders, we can predefine some values like prefix uh, or vendor. It's like, uh, orders from Amazon template. So we predefined some uh, address. Uh, so purchase order values is done and here we have uh, purchase order lines uh, values. Uh, so it's like acquisitions method, order format. Uh, so we'll be having something like physical resource. Uh, it will be a book, uh, so uh, predefined it here. Uh, we should we could use just uh, several, uh, like one and the second uh, will be a copy. Uh, and uh, yeah, some fund distribution, uh, physical resource details, so on, and location where it will go. Uh, so that's it for templates and uh, we can uh, go to orders application and uh, on clicking a new order we have template name here it's a drop down with available templates so if we, we choose uh, anything it the it pre-populates all values that uh, in template. Uh, basically, after it, we can just click save and uh, order will be created. Here we have our order. And by clicking on add PO line, uh, it prepopulates PO line values as well. So we can just go to instance uh, to inventory to look to some book what we want uh, and and uh, I think we just have to 
input a price for it. So if you're okay, you just click save and here we have our push third line with two books. You can create as many push third order lines as we want. So all values are pre-populated. Uh, order could be opened uh, and uh, after it we can receive uh, our things and uh, for the for order uh, life cycle. Mm, I believe that's it. I think it speed up the process for librarians as well. Mm, thank you. Any questions? So yes, thanks, Alexi. We um, we as a acquisitions librarian for almost thirty years, this is one of my favorite things: is having templates available to to make it so you're not having to put in the repetitive data. So um, lots of good work from Thunderjet these last three sprints. So thanks very much. Um, we are going to zoom ahead because we have uh, a bunch more. So we're going to move on to Spitfire. Um, if you have questions about any of the acquisition stuff, please put them in chat or contact the Thunderjet team afterwards. So uh, Max for Spitfire. Um, yeah, hello guys. Let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Um, okay. So the first thing which I want to show show you guys is filtering nodes by node types. Um, first of all, I'm going to eHolding Zap. I will be using eHolding Zap uh, to demonstrate this, but it's available to any app which uses nodes functionality. Um, I'm going to search for a package. Um, and if I open the model which we use for assigning and unassigning nodes, there is a new accordion called node type, uh, which is used uh, for searching for nodes by their types. So currently there is only three node types in the database. And for example, I can select a general node type. Um, and we see that as a result, we get a list of only one node, which is called some node. Uh, then I'm going to choose another node type, let it be another node type. And as you can see, we get a list with different nodes. Um, this is this is a multi-select, which means that we can select uh, more than one node type. I'm going to select all of them, and you can see that we see all of the nodes which you previously saw. Um, I guess that's all for this feature. Um, the next update from our team is yes is uh, searching by text only um, actually searching by text uh, was already demonstrated on the previous demo by carol but uh, since then we've made some changes to it um, so uh, previously i performed a search by a package title uh, by a package name um, and now uh, to to search for packages by text, I have to first click this checkbox search by text only. I'm clicking it and after after this, you can see that the search input and search buttons are disabled. Uh, this is because uh, in holdings, in e holding app, uh, we don't want to allow, allow a user to search by, uh, for example, package name and by text at the same time. Uh, and after I clicked, after I enabled search and by text, uh, I can, as usual, choose any text that I want and get corresponding results. Um, I guess that's it for this update. 
And the last thing which I want to show you is uh, nodes functionality in users app. Um, I'm gonna search for a user. Um, for example, this one. Um, and there is a new accordion, which, which is called nodes. Uh, and it currently says that there is no nodes that that are assigned to this user record. I'm gonna click new button. Um, we're on a create node page. I will choose a node type, uh, enter some node title, uh, some description. Um, this assigned section tells us the record to which the newly created node will be assigned to. So in our case, the node will be assigned to a user and the name of the user is, is here. Um, I'm gonna click save and close button. And as you can see, the newly created node uh, is now on the list. Uh, I can click it to see more information about it. Uh, uh, from this screen, we can go to edit page. We can change anything we want. I'm gonna change the node type to another node type. Saving the node, and you can see that the node information changed. Um, and I, I think the last, yes, the last, feature is that we can delete a node from here. Uh, after clicking delete, the delete button, we're seeing a message. Um, actually, it's strange. It, 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 it should say us uh, from which user it will be deleted from, but it doesn't. Okay, it will be a new ticket for Jira. So I'm gonna click the delete button. and we can see that the notes accordion is empty again. Um, I guess that's it from my side and from our team. Any questions, guys? So I have a question about the tags. It, is the searching basically a way to do the filtering or is filtering a, a different thing? Um, actually, we... First, uh, we called it filtering by text, but since we cannot combine it with usual search, we decided to call it search by text because actually okay. we, we don't get any results first, then that we then filter by text. The only thing we do, we just search for packages, in this case for packages by text. We, we don't filter anything. So that's why we call it search by text only, not filter. Okay. So when we talk about um, extending filter by tags to other apps, this is this is what we're going to do in the other apps as well. It sounds like is that right? Um, um, oh, Max that. Uh, no, we're not. This is okay. just uh, for e holdings because of uh, uh, how our data is handled. But for the other apps, it'll it'll work the same as agreements where you can search or search and filter by a tag. Okay, gotcha. All right, terrific. So it's great to see the notes uh, uh, start to come to life and the uh, enhancements for tags. So thanks very much, Max and mm, Kalila. Thank you, guys. And I'll talk for just a second. So Folijet's up next. Um, Folijet uh, one of the things we're not demonstrating today is related to the PubSub functionality, publish and subscribe. Um, that work has begun, but it's um, still a lot of the infrastructure that they're working on right now. So we expect in the next sprint demo to show some of that. Um, no, that's of a lot of interest to, to some of the other teams that are working on interactions between apps. Um, but for today, um, Sasha is going to show a bit about uh, kind of the last of the profile infrastructure. So we have the basic outlines of all of the profiles now that are used to import 
and we're starting to work on the details of those profiles. And then Taras is going to show um, a bit more of the refining of the integration with um, between source record storage and inventory. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Sasha. Yes, thank you. Let me start. Um, please let me know when you can see my screen. Yes. Uh, so thank you. Today I want to show uh, what was done for field mapping profiles. Um, basically, it is almost the same as others profiles. Uh, it uh, supports all the features like uh, uh, searching, uh, searching, uh, and we can search by uh, name, folio record type, and text. Uh, also, we can create new records. Uh, Let me just quickly fill it, uh, doesn't matter what. Um, yes, and it, after we create a new one, it instantly demonstrates its details. Um, also editing. And duplicating. And deleting. Um, besides that, uh, also uh, was added text for action profiles. Um, so let me create a new one and assign a few text for it. Um, and at the moment we are done with uh, basic uh, profiles functionality and we have started on uh, details uh, for match profiles. So here in the, on a new match profile form in the details accordion, we have this uh, tree view which demonstrates uh, connections between uh, record types uh, and for now uh, uh, it is uh, just this select but uh, in future we'll be able to choose uh, uh, not only common record type but a uh, record type to compare uh, and uh, this works just like a simple select so now it uh, does not uh, have any action, but uh, it can be as assigned any uh, functionality like by clicking on any of those. So that's basically it. Now I'm going to give over to Taras and if you have any question, please ask. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. questions or let's go on to Taras. Okay guys, uh, could you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, I will demonstrate you the uh, relatively new functionality for um, inventory application. It is uh, instance fields blocking functionality. Uh, let's say we have um, the, rec the instance uh, which has no mark record behind it. Uh, it is manual as you can see. So when we uh, try to edit the record, uh, we will see that uh, we can edit uh, any field you want. Uh, actually any field that uh, is situated on the form so um, you can add, delete, uh, and so on. Because uh, now records that uh, are created uh, without uh, mark record behind, 
uh, are allowed to edit any field. So now uh, we can search uh, uh, mark record based instance. Yeah. As you can see, you can view the source and you can hit edit and see that uh, only a few fields uh, are allowed to edit or add or something else. Uh, now our backend um, structure uh, backend rule structure allows us just to block the fields as a whole not uh, difference in the um, actions like uh, can add can edit or can delete but uh, front end uh, implementation of this uh, is uh, truly uh, ready for uh, um, differential um, uh, ACL rules uh, implementation, like when we will have uh, uh, separated rules for edit, add, and delete, it will work without uh, any changes required to front end. Um, also, uh, I can demonstrate you another feature that um, that is uh, suppressed from discovery changes. Uh, um, this functionality is for uh, edit this field uh, to suppress discovery from patterns um, and uh, add those changes into um, our mark record in our inventory. So let us check this. Uh, yeah, also we have um, um, loading and import job logs um, that showed us uh, this record with uh, suppressed from discovery false, uh, set to false. So now we set it to true. So you can see this. And then we will just renew the record, uh, a log record and we will see that uh, suppress from discovery uh, has been set to true. Yeah, as you can see this. So um, that is basically it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you very much, Taras. And so for everyone who will be um, outputting the, um, the records from source record storage to feed their discovery, having a way to be able to set that suppress from discovery flex was a, a super important one. And so this is the one piece of editing and inventory uh, in the instance that can actually affect the source record instead of the other way around where the source record is controlling the instance in all the other cases. So thanks very much. All right, and if questions, put them in chat or contact uh, Sasha or Taras and we're gonna move on to Vega. Okay, um, hey everyone. Let me share my screen. Um, okay, can you see it? Um, today, I want to show you a reset password behavior. It was uh, reworked recently by a Vega team. First of all, permission to reset password was deleted, so user can reset password without permissions. Also, password validation was moved to the backend. So, firstly, let's uh, get a link. I have procreated user for this. And uh, let's uh, sit uh, in an incognito tab. Okay. Uh, let's add some uh, password. As you can see, uh, password validation occurs after the submit. And let's create a valid password, for example. OK, 
Okay. And let's uh, log in to the follower platform. Um, probably that's all from my side. If you have any questions, please contact me. And uh, um, that's all. Thank you. It's so quick and easy. Looks good. <laughs> All right, Alexander. Okay, uh, hello. Uh, uh, I'm sharing my screen. And do you see it? Yes. Okay, uh, so uh, today I'm going to show you rework at Stuff Sleeps tokens functionality and also updates uh, in check in and check out nodes. I already prepared templates uh, with list of all available tokens and UI part uh, of adding tokens was already presented on previous demos, so I'm going to skip this part. Uh, in order to uh, receive uh, more data for tokens, I uh, updated existed item, and also I've added uh, check-in and check-out nodes. So uh, let's try to uh, check-in some item. Uh, Check in. Uh, as you can see, uh, new fields uh, added to the nodes. It's date and uh, source who, who was uh, added this uh, node. Let's confirm it. And system proposes us to print sleep, uh, which was uh, taken from the staff sleeps uh, template. And uh, here we see uh, list of available tokens filled with serial data, for, data from the item. Uh, also, this functionality can be accessed via uh, this menu. We uh, can review check-in nodes once again, and also we can uh, print uh, transit sleep if, we, if it's needed. So now let's try to uh, check out item. First, we need to choose some user, and let's uh, enter a barcode. So, in this case, we also have updated checkout checkout nodes, and we have date and source. Uh, I guess that's it. If you have questions, please ask. That looks really good, Alexander. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right, questions in chat or to the team. We're gonna keep moving through because we've still got a bunch of folks. So we're gonna switch over to Concord and Victor. Hello, uh, hello, Maria, hello guys. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen, uh, one second. Uh, could you please uh, tell me if you see it? Yes. Okay, uh, the first, feature which I would like to demonstrate is the change uh, which we introduced uh, at the beginning of um, the first one which introduced actually is uh, changes to location um, locations uh, settings uh, and this is about uh, locations list for, uh, for now we have a location list feature with more information which were uh, before and visibility to sort uh, data just in order to to compare our stuff, uh, I would like to demonstrate the previous version where we just had um, uh, location names and uh, which are basically clickable links uh, in order to open details and stuff. And now we extended uh, the information and uh, now we have status and code as well. And uh, the all, uh, and sorting and uh, other functionalities remain uh, remains uh, the same. So this is the first one. The next one is uh, that we added validation for code, uh, for location code for institution campuses and libraries uh, features because we will need this feature in future for circulation rules editor, which will rely on uh, that codes. So, and uh, for us, it's important to have them uh, required. Probably in the future, we will uh, add more on validation stuff in order to restrict validation uh, even more. For now, it's uh, the same as for a uh, name field. Uh, okay, and uh, the next feature which I would like to demonstrate is uh, if you find fields 
for overdue loans report. And this is uh, another field uh, which required a lot of backend work in order to complete it and a bit of work from BI. So this is just in the dub with uh, if you find value for items uh, in overdue loans report. And uh, another feature which we added uh, while working here is uh, to ensure that when we hit overview once report uh, button, we only uh, demonstrate here items uh, which uh, are in the past because before it was only uh, it was also included uh, once with which are basically with the status open. So for now we had a restriction on due date field as well. And the last feature which I would like to demonstrate is uh, changes to UI uh, users app uh, because we introduced it only for this one. However, uh, it will be uh, easily reused uh, for other applications. So this is like uh, for a footer with uh, cancel and save uh, button, save and close button. And uh, as I said, this is a shared components, uh, component which other apps uh, may easily reuse. And I just, in order to compare it, I added a link for previous behavior when we have a cancel button in here in the drop down and the save button uh, up here. So now it looks uh, that way. So that's me, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions or uh, should I uh, move? Uh, uh, like to Dmitro. Just want to clarify something, Victor, about the overdue loans feature, yep. um, and that um, you mentioned that the loans are in the past. And I just wanted to clarify that's the due date that was in the past. There was a bug where the um, it was pulling all open loans, including the ones that weren't overdue. So that's what was fixed in um, the past couple sprints. It's yeah, right. yeah, thank you. That's right. That looks good. And the, the enhancements on the locations, I think, are going to be really helpful as libraries start building out their really large location lists. So that is really nice. It's and it's will, yeah, it's, sorry. I'm, no, no, go. I, I just wanted to add that it will look even more better when once uh, changes for, uh, to list components, uh, which are done by John Cooper, will be merged because, uh, as I saw, so it will be. Um, Really uh, cool uh, change uh, both in from uh, usability perspective and how uh, it looks. And there was a question in chat about is this the new preferred UX for save cancel? And yes, this was uh, one of the changes that was based on the usability testing that Kalila did a few weeks ago um, to uh, make it more prominent and make it so that you don't have to scroll back up to the top of the record to hit save um, by having the save and cancel always persisting on the bottom of the screen. So that's going to be a nice change, I think, but something that we're going to need to implement across a, you know, a lot of the apps. All right, and Dimitro. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, okay, let me share my screen. Uh, one moment. Good to share it. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'm going to be demonstrating a feature that we've been working on. It's about saving a pattern group for anonymous loans. It's uh, a backend only ticket. Uh, so uh, I opened uh, an active user details and we can see that it uh, he belongs to staff pattern group. Now I'm going to check out an item. Okay, a loan has been created. Uh, now I'm going to check that item in to make uh, the loan closed. And I'm going back to user details to his closed loan loans. Uh, but before I need to remember 
uh, that loan ID. Here it is. Okay, and now I'm going to anonymize uh, all loans for this borrower. Okay. Uh, let's assume they all have been anonymized. Now I, I will uh, try to get loan details. And we have a pattern group at checkout as uh, available at, uh, in the server response. So this is probably all. If you have any questions, please ask. Thank you, Dimitro. I know anonymizing is going to be super important for some of the library or for a lot of the libraries. Yeah. All right, we're going to keep moving. We've got half an hour left. So Stripes for us, Ryan. Yep. Uh, so the UI app template. All right. Go ahead and share over here. Okay. So um, uh, something that I had started early on was moving um, the UI app template out of uh, Stripe CLI. So this is uh, when you go to create a new app. Um, all the, the templates were stored in the CLI uh, repository. And um, what we wanted to do was to move it into its own um, repository in GitHub um, for a few reasons. One, so that it would just be easier to find um, for maintenance, but also um, a big, um, a big reason um, why we wanted this is that it would be able to run under its own um, CI CD process so that um, any uh, we could run tests on it and um, uh, when we go to update the template if um, if there are any breaking changes we can catch them early so that when people are generating new applications they're not uh, generating applications with uh, faulty code or um, that uh, have broken tests out of the box. So just a uh, quick test of that. Um, so you could just create something um, and so what the CLI does um, is it actually pulls down the latest um, from master of this US UI app template. And um, so now um, it's pulled that down and it's now installing the, um, the NPM packages. Uh, this takes a minute to do. So I actually have um, an app already created um, that's, that's already installed. And um, effectively, what it gives you is um, I have it open here, and it's replaced. Um, it has a lot of uh, placeholders with double underbars, and <clears throat> it replaces them with the name that you gave it. In this case, I just called it Ryan. Um, so it's stuck that there. Um, this is now like Ryan settings. Um, and it also generates um, a readme and um, replaces everything uh, with the name you have and then just some basic instructions for running the new application. So if I were to um, go ahead and run that, um, it's going to spin up um, a local server and then I can start um, experimenting with my app and um, it has a few things um, out of the box just to kind of get you started. Just make sure that it just takes a second here. Um, OK. 
Okay, we should have it now. Okay, yep, so here's my new app, Ryan. And uh, yeah, it gives you an examples page with the modal. Um, it also links to the Stripes component readme. Um, so as a new developer, you know what you have available to you. And then um, you also get an entry in the settings and give you a general and feature settings along with um, translations for your app. And um, yeah, there, there's a few other things. Um, there's a like that suite of um, uh, big tests that you get. So if I just say yarn test, um, that'll run through some tests that you get. Um, and um, so that way uh, developers are encouraged to, to do that, but they don't actually have to set the tests up. Um, And it's also templated with your app name. But that's um, it's kind of the gist of it. There's there's a lot that was already existing, but the main thing is it's in its own repository. Um, the templating syntax is a little bit different so that um, you can run tests against this repo as it stands before it's templated. Um, and run linting against it. Um, so it just, we should have a much more stable template for people to use. Okay, and these are the tests running very quickly. Um, that's about it. Uh, any questions? That looks awesome. I think packaging it up, making it easier for the UI devs. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be really nice and also the encouraging of the testing piece. I think that's all really great and you got a really nice compliment from Zach in the chat. Oh. <laughs> from everybody in the chat. This looks great. Yeah, thank you great. very much. Thanks everyone. Yeah, and this also might be an opportunity later on to add more examples um, for people as they move forward, but should help with that. So thank you. Awesome. All right. And Rasmus? Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Give me one second here. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So yeah, I'm just going to briefly go over uh, some changes that we did to improve uh, scannability. And uh, one of the big things that you probably have um, noticed is this um, updated main uh, navigation. So uh, the changes we did here obviously changed the background color, uh, improved the uh, color contrast, um, increased font sizes a bit, and also made the, the current app uh, a little bit more visible uh, with this uh, yeah, blue uh, fill here. Uh, and and um, the other changes with, that we have done to improve scannability is um, font weights. We've changed font weights uh, in a lot of different areas of the app, including filter headers, uh, pane headers. Um, we also, if we can go to users here, you can see that. We also have the uh, multi-column list headers uh, that are bolded out, and uh, the color is 100% uh, black now. And also, the uh, details view has been updated to, uh, to have a little more bold text here. So um, hopefully, this will improve uh, scannability uh, uh, throughout the app. Um, also, um, we made some changes to the MCL styling. So we updated the background colors, so you can it's, it's, it should be easier now to distinguish uh, the different rows from each other. And also we added the borders between uh, each cell, which also uh, hopefully should uh, improve uh, scannability. So um, yeah, these changes are currently in review and we're not, uh, we're not done yet. We're gonna 
make some more changes. Um, so yeah, we, you might see some adjustments uh, later on, but um, I think already now it, it's, it's looking really good. So um, yeah, I think that's it for me. I'll stop sharing. It's great to see these these iterative changes coming in and uh, all of us with the eyes that are getting older, thank you for the darker and the uh, the more readable fonts. So thank you very much. All right, we're going to uh, move on to core functional. Zach? Hi there. I am going to show some things um, mostly on inventory. A lot of this is work that was either done on the back end or done on the front end by Nels. Um, in inventory, uh, for instances, we have a whole bunch of new lookup tables. There's a resource identifier type, uh, classification identifier types. We've got modes of issuance now, as well as nature of content. Uh, and instant note types. So these are all essentially lookup tables that get reflected in a record. So if you go into an inventory record uh, and then look at an instance record, um, you can see, you know, we have these identifier types. We have, um, I don't remember where all these are. <laughs> you know, we've got, uh, notes and note types. So basically all these tables that we've added on the back end are now being reflected on the front end as well. So um, continuing to fill out the instance record. Um, and Zach, could I just mm -hmm. interrupt for a sec? So uh, we saw notes earlier. The notes here are um, bibliographic notes that are totally yes. separate from the, the notes app that, that uh, folks were demonstrating. Is that right? Yes, that's an important clarification. <laughs> okay. Yeah, as you can see, Henri, we have uh, renamed uh, the notes accordion to uh, be uh, named instance notes now to, to have this distinction between the note helper app and the uh, bibliographic um, instance notes. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so the other thing to note, to note about notes uh, is that here on the, uh, the instance record, you can also add multiple notes if you'd like. So that is, uh, it used to be you can only add one, uh, as we have on holdings records and on item records, you can now add as many notes as you want. So the instance record behaves the same way. One of the other things I wanted to talk about was search. Um, there are a lot of bug fixes that we went through in this last couple of sprints. We don't normally demo bug fixes, but anybody who's dealt with um, search has um, perhaps been frustrated by it because um, of inconsistencies with regard to searching for barcodes or searching for identifiers. Um, you can see I have uh, an instance record here that has an ISBN and an ISSN and then another ISBN here that's got a dash in the middle of it. Dashes used to throw, um, uh, actually let's just reset the search. Dashes used to throw things off. I think we'd get a, an error message, uh, but that should be working now. Oh, no, oh, DEF. So you can see uh, all this stuff is working. One, two, three. We've got right truncation as well going on. So um, a lot of work um, by the back end folks to basically <laughs> really, really improve search. Uh, so if you're someone who's in inventory, uh, you should notice that. Notice that the, the all search works uh, and then searching via identifier contributor. There've been a lot of improvements there on the back end and then we've been able to leverage that work to um, present cleaner results um, on the front end. There's a bunch of different tickets that are all related to search. I'm not gonna go into um, every single one of those, but it's better is what it comes down to. Uh, the last thing I wanted to present here, uh, for a while we've had a, um, oops, I made this too big and I lost my edit button. For a while we've had a button in the user uh, uh, app so that you could add all permissions. This was not a reliable button in the past. 
It did not necessarily add all permissions. Um, now it actually does. So again, if you're someone who's dealing with permissions, uh, whether as testing or in terms of uh, adding permissions to users or creating permission sets, the add all permissions button is 100% uh, functional now. That is it for me. All right, thanks, Zach. And yes, mm -hmm. all of us who are searching, uh, welcome the changes, keep them coming. So. <laughs> Um, Michal. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks. Thank you, Zach, for demoing this. Let me just share my screen here. Um, can you can you see it here? Yes. Um, okay, let me just flip here. So I, I have a couple couple small changes to show you too. Um, the first one is um, related to um, moving the existing requests to a different uh, different item. So as you can see, we have this new uh, option now called move request now on the uh, request details screen. And if I hit that, um, I should be able to see all other items which are associated with the same instance as the item uh, of the request I'm trying to move. Um, so in this case, we have uh, four, four other items. I will just pick maybe the book one here. Um, and after I click that, you can see that uh, the request has been moved to, to this different item. Um, this, this looks pretty simple, but um, there are actually a lot of edge cases. Uh, some of them are related to making sure that uh, the request is being moved to a specific uh, position in the queue. Um, and, and the other, other big issue is making sure that the request type is also uh, correctly uh, set up depending on the item we are moving it to. And all that work has been done on the, on the server side by William and Jeremy. So thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. I know it was quite a bit of work. Um, Okay, let's just maybe move to another thing here. Um, so another thing I would like to show you here is kind of um, similar to what Zach mentioned about the search. We we put a couple small improvements which should be uh, available to you uh, across different uh, uh, modules. So one of them is, uh, let me just search for something here. Uh, one of them is um, this ability to clear uh, the previous query manually. And when I do that, you can see that the, the search result is also cleared out. So this was not available before. Um, another little thing here is that when I uh, hit reset all, um, the query string is also cleared out. This wasn't here before either. So that should, should make the experience a little bit nicer. <laughs> Um, let's see the next, uh, next one, let me just move this here. The next little thing here we, is that we added this item damage status to the um, inventory item form. So um, before I, I believe we didn't have that. Um, now you should be able to pick one of those and um, it should be available. Um, and the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we recently ran into some performance issues across different modules. Um, um, you could notice them mostly on big forms like this uh, instance form. You can see it's uh, it's a pretty large form now and it got to the point where you would not be able to scroll or, or, or like type uh, something here. Um, and there, there is a bunch of work uh, done in uh, Stripes Connect, mostly by um, Zach, Mark, uh, uh, and Victor, who contributed some ideas to, to improving that. And we also um, switched to a different uh, library called Final Form, um, which uh, should improve the performance quite a bit. So you can see I'm finally able to like scroll and uh, type here without any issues. Um, and as the outcome of this work, we, we also created this new um, module called Stripes Final Form, which is uh, very similar to what we had with uh, before with Redux Form, which, which is basically just a, like a wrapper around Final Form, uh, which should allow you to integrate quickly with any Stripes, uh, existing Stripes uh, Form modules. Um, and that's it from me. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Definitely more search changes. Good. 
Um, 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 who are we up to? Magda? Yes, uh, hello everyone. I will uh, demo some simple uh, examples of title level requests. Let me share my screen. Please let me know when you see it. Not yet. Here it comes. All right. Uh, do you see my uh, EBSCO discovery services? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of simple scenarios and um, I assume there will be more questions. I'm open to answer them. I, we are running out of time, so please uh, ping me on Slack or through email. Um, the functionality that I'm going to present is on the EDS, uh, EBSCO Discovery Services available in production and on the folio is a part of uh, Q3.1 release. Uh, we will have another uh, EDS release uh, next week, but I will talk about this later. Uh, for the uh, for the demo, we uh, um, using our uh, integration environment. I have a folio test account set up. This is Cecilia Chang uh, patron, and we see she already has few um, checkouts, holds, and fees as well. We are going to uh, try to s uh, create a title level request. Let's uh, look for the item. As we see here, we have two uh, copies of the Trumpeter of Krakow, and one of them is uh, checked out. So we would like to place the hold without worrying about the checked out item. We want to have it in the back entrance, and we want to keep it until tomorrow. So if we go to the request in folio, we should see now the request created for Cecilia Chang, the trumpeter from Krakow. And let's see, it's page, which means we picked the available copy. Now let's go to another scenario when we have to uh, items checked out, two items that are associated with a given title and they are checked out. Um, this will be and those two copies are um, checked out. One is due tomorrow or today and the uh, the other one is um, due at the end of the month. So let's place the, uh, the hold. Pick the same location. If we go to the requests, this is the uh, item that we have requested. It's currently checked out and the due day is uh, August 13. So indeed we picked the, uh, the item with the uh, earliest due date. And the, at the end, I would like to show a quick uh, teaser on the EDS site. So this is the example of multi-volume item. Uh, at this point, if we place the hold, it will pick uh, one of the um, of the uh, available items, which is not the desired behavior because uh, each 
item is a different volume. Uh, next week, we will be releasing new version of EDS that will be handling the volume uh, uh, cases like that. So we will demo it during the next volume demo. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magda. And I know title level is important to a number of libraries. So thanks very much. All right, surprise guest. Um, Eric Veluk is going to uh, just show a couple things real quick, and then we're going to move on to Anton. And Eric's from Core Platform, I should say. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you see my screen, I assume? Yes. Um, just going to uh, rewind a bit to show you the slides that we uh, flipped past really quickly. There's two very important uh, optimizations that have been done uh, by the core platform team. Uh, the first one is the addition of CQL array modifiers, which were indirectly demoed by Zach a bit ago when he was querying in inventory storage, um, because the, all of those uh, drop downs options use this query. And uh, the documentation is available at the link you see there um, for objects like the one shown you can create CQL like the property equals uh, slash at type one, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, this is about 10 times faster than the previous method, which was using regex expressions. Um, and uh, it does require a schema change um, to note the uh, fields that are indexed, like are being used here. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, the takeaway is that it's much faster and easier to use. Um, so the second uh, optimization that's been added is the, the ability to query across tables. Um, previously, views were used to uh, emulate this functionality, and the view itself captured the join. Um, but now you can use CQL, um, like displayed here um, at the bottom. Um, the table system that you see there is also a real world example from mod inventory storage where an item is related to an instance and you usually query on the instances to ask the item barcode. Um, this is all done um, at any arbitrary depth. It could be one deep, it could be three deep, it could be 10 deep. Um, I would not, not recommend that, but I guess you could. <clears throat> um, and it's done using subqueries. Uh, the, uh, there's two new properties that can be added optionally to the schema, um, table alias and target table alias. These are done to eliminate ambiguity that can happen if there's more than one foreign key pointing to a table. Uh, the logic can be directed to a dead end if it doesn't get the uh, pathfinding correctly from one to the next. Um, I'm already going a little bit over my time, but I um, just want to highlight those things. And if you're interested in using them, please strike up a conversation and read the documentation on the Ramo module builder. That's all for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Zach. And these slides, like you said, these are in the, the deck that folks will get after the meeting. Sorry, not Zach, Eric. All right. Um, Last but not least is Anton about QA. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let me hit present. Okay, so the uh, quality dashboard has been updated yesterday. The link is on the uh, slide if you're interested. The highlights, well, I keep stressing the code coverage is important. And this is the list for the core platform modules. And you can see that we still have a lot that um, uh, modules that don't uh, pass the 80% 80 uh, cutoff. So uh, please keep uh, plugging away and uh, add code, uh, code coverage. Uh, because uh, uh, what it does, it kind of reduces number of defects that we find. And this is the uh, results from uh, 
the bug fest 3.1. So this is a screenshot from the test rail when we ran through over 550 test cases and we only had 28 failed, uh, 28 failed. So all the work that you put in uh, by building the big tests and other unit tests, uh, it pays off here. So if we didn't have enough unit tests, then this picture would be not that green, it would be much more orange or red. Uh, so overall for the project size of this magnitude, we found only 40, 46 defects and 14 of them were found by Test.io, uh, which is a crowd, uh, crowdsourced uh, testing company. I will cover that in a minute, but overall only two P1s uh, which one of them, both of them are kind of fixed and 11 uh, P2. So we are overall, it feels like we're doing pretty well. And so I can't stress enough that work that we put up front when we write unit tests and when we do integration tests uh, is it just prevents, uh, you know, escape defects and that's what we observe, so we just have to keep keep doing what we're doing. Um, now, the Test.io, Test.io is the company that um, provides a uh, different type of manual testing. And we run the pilot test cycle with them just to see how they uh, fire uh, under pressure. So we kind of push them off the boat into the water and told them, Here's e-holdings, inventory, uh, check-in, check-out, and users modules. Go see what you can find. So they, it took the, so they brought in 35 testers. It took, them, it took them one day. They tested on both Windows and um, Mac using Chrome. And the good news is that this is the experienced testers. So they, uh, they don't have enough uh, library domain knowledge, but they good at breaking software. And all they were able to find is mostly P3s and P4s. So there were no, there were no P2, I think it was one P2 bug that they were, that we reclassified as P2 bug that uh, they were able to find. Other than that, they didn't find much. Uh, so again, Guys, credit to to you all. It just kudos to the to all the teams that uh, did a good job and put out the release that kind of was not was not easy easy to break. We all know where things not working well, but besides the point, uh, users can get things done, accomplish their tasks, and uh, relatively uh, relatively fast. We only had one performance issue with bark, uh, bark, uh, search by barcode that has been fixed already. So overall, we did pretty well. So that's uh, kind of all I have uh, at the moment. And thank you all for your attention. And don't let me uh, stand between your lunch or your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Anton. And if you don't mind just scrolling through the next few slides so we don't have to switch off. Um, we've got a two week sprint, uh, two sprints coming up and then we're gonna try to do the next uh, sprint demo after that. These are basically the sprints to get your Q3 work done before we get into the hardening. Um, and after the sprint slide, there are the plans from the various uh, teams as to what they're going to be working on in the next few sprints. Um, all of this is in the deck that you'll get after the meeting along with the link to the recording. So if you have questions about any of the coming sprint work, check in with the team or the product owner. Um, and thanks very much. By my count, we got through 21 presenters in 95 minutes. So thanks everybody for, um, for speeding through and for the good questions and good comments. Um, it continues to amaze me how much awesome work is coming out every time. So thanks very much, everybody. And off to your meals. <laughs>
All right. Take care. Right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.